the local homeless population, which we contribute to fairly regularly with material goods and stuff. But you know, it's kind of like you get gifts, you like you get a gift card, you can get what you need. They probably have 10,000 coats right now and need a bunch of other stuff. And so we'll give them some money and they can go get that other stuff that they need. So fifth Sunday is coming up and that's what we do with our fifth Sunday offering. Um, Another thing about Fifth Sunday, and I, this is what I want to talk to you about. Last week and the week before, we talked about all the folks that are at home because of COVID. Not because necessarily because they're sick, so to speak, but because they're older, they're vulnerable, those sorts of things. They're staying in, uh, and they're staying very, very careful. And so we talked about that, and, and of course, there's only so much ministry and, that you can do over the live stream. We talked about that. There's only so much ministry you can do over the phone. Here's an idea that I have, and I want to talk to you all about it, because I think that we can provide a way to, to bring some of our folks back into the sanctuary on that fifth Sunday evening service. And I would personally invite those who are shutting themselves in Right. And, and we know some of the names and some of the couples, the Wances and and uh, and um, Estella and, and oh, there's a whole list of people that are being super duper careful. Fifth Sunday in the evening and we could gather, but maybe not. All, I don't really know how to go about this. But what I see is I could tell them you I, we would love to have you in the sanctuary. We're designing a service of song and prayer and worship and time in the word. And we will all be very careful with you. We will be wearing masks on Sunday evening in honor of our friends. And that is what they are doing. And that is how they are comfortable. And I've thought about this and I just I'm I'm I want to do that for them. I don't know if anybody would ever say, yeah, I don't know if anybody would want to come. But I wanted to talk to you guys about it. And, and we'll have that service. It'll be special to us. But in honor and respect for those who are not coming right now, not able to or feel extra vulnerable around crowds, that is what I would ask. And I think that in, in you know, showing support, showing love, I think that we can do that. Um, and again, I, it, 100 people, fifth Sunday service, like I said, I don't know how to manage the. If, if the folks come and there's 100 people here, even with masks, that's not gonna be cool. You're going to have to really work with me on it. You're going to have to really um, make a sacrifice because I, we know how we feel about these things. But like I said, in honor and respect for those, and if they would come and hear the word and sing some songs and, and see their brothers and sisters, believe me, when I, I hear their voices over the phone, I think it would be so beneficial. So I just want to put that bug in your ear. I'll let you know more as I make phone calls and write emails and those sorts of things. But I know that it, you know, is something that we can do for each other and for our brothers and sisters who are still um, very, very concerned, shall we say. Okay? So I wanted to talk to you about that um, because that, that would be a requirement, so to speak, out of, like I said, respect for our brothers and sisters who would come. That is what I would ask of you. And um, I just think it would be great if they could get out of their houses and come to church. So anyway, I'm going to open up with a word of prayer. I will ask anybody. I was going to say I can't find my glasses. I will ask anybody who would like to come and sing to come up and sing with me. Grab a hymnal and come on up. We'll open up in worship. And then we are going back into Matthew in a big way today. I've got a, a lot in store. We'll see how it all plays out. I have no idea how much we will get to, but um, I find it fascinating and uplifting, and I pray that you will as well. Would you join me in prayer, please? <clears throat> Father God, we love you, Lord. We love you, and we appreciate you who you are, what you have done, what you do every single day, Lord, the promises for ourselves and for our future. And we come before you today, a submitted people, brothers and sisters bound together by your Holy Spirit to look upwards, Lord, not at some fake heaven, 
but to look upwards at that cross and understand what you've done and worship you and learn from you and grow and become the people that you know we can be individually and collectively. So we come to you, Lord, as we always do and say, would you please assume your position as the pastor of this church? As our teacher, as our wisdom. By the power of your Holy Spirit, may we honor you today. In what we sing, in what we pray, in the fellowship that we share. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. So, we'll open up with a prelude and a candle lighting. And then we will begin with a couple of nice choruses. Thank you, Pete.
you stand as you're able? And before I get started, I didn't think that my wife was just looking at me adoringly. I forgot to make an announcement. And that is uh, that they vote with your change for the Christmas apparel concert. I, I did put it up in the announcement, but I'll make sure that you do that. Thank you, guys. Sweet, sweet spirit.
come before you now, Father God, in your word. May you open our minds and open our hearts to the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. In your mighty name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you guys so much. The choosing of the hymns this week had an ulterior, had a ulterior motive as well. One, the amazing theology that is there and all of the concepts and ideas that are going to be relative to the gospel according to Matthew. You're going to see all of those things in what we do and where, how we open up the word today. The other... <laughs> that's my boy, so I can't really yell at anybody, can I? I wouldn't anyway. You guys know that. Uh, but anyway... Uh, the other uh, thing is that we redid all of the electronic stuff over there. We went digital, and I wasn't sure it was going to work, so we went out of the hymnal. So there's an ulterior motive for everything, right? Not everything. Ulterior motive for preaching the gospel. Oh my goodness, what have you done to my grandchild? When I approached this, and I, and I thought, when we enter into a new year, I want to approach a gospel. And we want to really move into a gospel account. And so we, we like I said, we dabbled in the beginning of Matthew there around Christmas time in chapters one and chapters two. And then last week, we really set the framework of how we were going to move through Matthew. We talked about what a gospel is and what a gospel isn't. We talked about the four accounts and kind of got an idea for where we're heading and why we're heading there. I suggested to you that in the Gospel of Matthew, not a suggestion, it's a fact, there's nothing really random. It is a brilliantly composed narrative. It is a brilliantly composed book of the Bible and every aspect of it has relevance not just to the preaching of the truth, but in the teaching of the way. Oh, good morning, Beth. Mm -hmm. Every aspect of it. And to this end, this is one of those areas where your chapter and verse and all of those subheadings don't do you any, don't do you much good. Because we have this idea, and you correct me if I'm wrong, from like chapter 3-ish on to chapter 7, after the Sermon on the Mount, we have this idea that Jesus was giving classes. Am I wrong? Here's the subheading. Here's the teaching about anger. And so we would sit down and we would do this little, and then there would be some sort of a break or what have you, because this is our thinking. And then we move to the next subheading. And now Jesus is going to erase the chalkboard and put up here teaching about adultery. And then we're going to be all done with, you see what I'm saying? And so this is where you can do one of two things. And I wanted to introduce you to this resource. I have a couple of these types of Bibles. This is <clears throat> Christian Standard Translation Reader's Bible. And there's no numbers in here. There's no subheadings. There's no anything. It's just one long narrative the way it was sort of written. Now, there are a few points of reference so you can find the Gospel of Matthew at ease. But once it begins, it just goes through. And this is a really neat resource because, again, it fits our way of thinking very well to compartmentalize all of the different teachings. But we don't get the flavor, shall we say, the power sometimes or the relevance of one section of Scripture with another. Because there is nothing that is just randomly plunked in there from outer space. It's all interconnected. It's all one message, all about the same thing, all pointing in one direction. And our Bibles teach us that. So when we are, that's the first thing I want to say as we move forward now into what we would call the Sermon on the Mount and those sorts of things. It isn't fill up the chalkboard, erase it, fill up the chalkboard again, erase it. It's Jesus and he's moving from one 
group of people to another, one teaching to another, that's really, again, remember when we started this off, he's preaching and teaching to the Hebrew population. And so it's a lot, it's, it's going to ring and resonate and resound with their Jewish ears. And then we look at what he did there and how, this is where we're going today, he bridges from the old covenant to the new. And now, all of a sudden, these teachings are ringing and resonating and very profound for our New Testament ears. I mean, it's amazing how when he has this group of people, he leads them through his presence, through his teaching, from the old to the new, in ways that they can understand and relate to. Now, I'm going to put forth to you that those ways are the same ways we can relate to and understand. And understanding them, and we've said this from the very beginning, gives our faith roots. We, we know from where we came. We know the promises of where we are going. And we know the big worldview picture it's not a shallow gospel. It's not a shallow understanding. And you know, scripture is full of that. Shallow understandings lead to, here comes the storm, gone. I'm out of here. We're going to talk a little bit about that. It's right in the very beginning. We, we, we said that one of the first things that Jesus teaches us is about spiritual warfare and conflict. The discipleship model Right is moving from slaves of Egypt through the water and we go right into paradise. No, we're led into the wilderness for a time of testing. Is your heart really where you say it is? Let's find out. The testing is going to come because the evil one controls the rest of the world, right? Outside of the kingdom of God. So it's going to happen whether the spirit of God leads us there or not. But we understand that there is a time of testing period for all followers of Jesus Christ. It's not a shallow understanding. It's not a shallow faith. It's meant to be this way because we're not playing church. We're fighting evil because we're not just dallying around, you know, building the kingdom of God. And I, I, I don't, right? We're not one program after another and look at this church. We're fighting evil. We are enemy soldiers plunked down behind, en or we are soldiers plunked down behind enemy lines. This is the forward operating base of the kingdom of God here in Churchtown. We come here to be equipped. And when we leave, we bring light into the darkness because the spirit of God is within us. That's powerful. And if you're not really on board with that, you not, you're not going to last your first battle. You just won't. So when we go into this, I want to I take a look. Go ahead with Matthew 4 here. When Jesus heard that John had been arrested, arrested, he left Judea and returned to Galilee. He went first to Nazareth, left there, and moved to Capernaum beside the Sea of Galilee in the region of Zebulun and Naphtali. This fulfilled what God said through the prophet Isaiah. Now, knowing what we know and where we've gone with Matthew already, you're, I've said this a hundred times, you're going to see this a hundred times. This is done to fulfill the prophecy. This is done as the prophet said. This is done, etc. And there's that bridge back and forth between the old and the new. Jesus is the Christ of God. All you Hebrew people, he is the Messiah you have been waiting for. And he's not just up there saying it. I'm, I'm prophecy after prophecy after prophecy is fulfilled. It's not random. It's not coincidence, right? In the land of Zebulun and of Naphtali, beside the sea, beyond the Jordan River, in Galilee, where so many Gentiles live, the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. And for those who lived in the land where death casts its shadow, a light has shined. 
From then on, Jesus began to preach, repent of your sins, turn to God, for the kingdom of heaven is near. So this is where, again, following the line here, Jesus moves through his baptism. And his baptism is interesting as foretold by John the Baptist. I baptize with water, but one is coming very soon who will baptize with water and the Holy Spirit. There's the first inkling that something is going to be different about following this rabbi. How do you baptize with the Holy Spirit of God? Well, you're God. He can do it. And so he moves through this, and we have that scene at his baptism, baptism with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We see, we hear, we experience the triune nature of our holy God. And from then on, Jesus himself moves forward to be a light in a dark world. He, as it says, begins his ministry. And what's the first thing he preaches? Get on your knees and beg me for salvation. No. The first thing he, re he preaches is repent. Turn around. Pay attention. Because the kingdom of God is here. That is very, very interesting and very, very substantial to the church then, obviously, and to the church today. How is the kingdom of God here? Perhaps it has something to do with that baptism of the Holy Spirit. Perhaps it has something to do with the uniqueness of Jesus' baptism, which was not only a ritualistic cleansing by water, but this indwelling of God's Holy Spirit, this presence of God's Holy Spirit. Now we're not just talking about the physical, right? Ritualistic cleansing. And I can say from the outside in, look at me. I'm being righteous. But something is happening from the inside out. And he's leading the people that he's teaching to understand this. And to understand it then is to understand it now. As we are led from our own slavery to sin, through the waters, right? Through the baptism of the water and the spirit to be what we call, and John says, reborn, a new creature. And then we go and we begin our ministry as followers of Jesus Christ. And then from that point, I see that's what it looks like. You talk about, well, what are the Beatitudes? What is the Sermon? Then he's saying, this is what it looks like. So from the beginning all the way through, and this is where I'm going to be assigning homework, you're going to see this thread from chapter 1 through chapter 7. Because I'm not just going to take pieces of the Beatitudes as they are written in most Bibles and preach to you, you better be good, right? You better pay attention to this. Yes, we should, but we should because Jesus is showing us collectively through this amazing teaching, through this amazing demonstration, what it means to move from the physical to the spiritual, what it means to be having to be controlled from the outside, the law, here it is, follow it, it's oppressive, follow the law, to controlling yourself by the power of God's Holy Spirit from the inside. It's the new way, it's the new thing, as it is called. It is those strange people of God who follow a king that they cannot see by a spirit that they experience in very different and unique ways, but yet are bound together by one God and one spirit and one message. How is any of this possible? Well, the church and people like you and I have spent the last couple thousand years working on that, working through it, digging through it in the gospels, in the word, 
Who are we as a people of God? Who am I as a follower of Jesus? There aren't many better scriptures than what we call the Sermon on the Mount. But I want you to see that there's a continuation here from Egypt through the wilderness into the kingdom of God. From Egypt through the wilderness into the kingdom of God. From your slavery to sin and death through your baptism of water and the Holy Spirit, through your time of trial to find out where your heart really is in the kingdom of God. And when we get to that Sermon on the Mount, he's like, this is the kingdom of God. He doesn't ask us to build it. He doesn't ask us to do much except understand that when you give your life to Christ and submit your heart by the power of the Holy Spirit as Jesus Christ is your Savior and your Lord, you become a part of it. We want to talk a little bit more about that. So we talk about the disciples, right? Is verse 18 even up there, hon? Yeah, it is. One day... Hun, she's my daughter, so I'm not being like sexist or misogynist. I don't, <laughs> you guys aren't like that. Maybe, I don't know. Um, but uh, actually, it's my son-in-law. Hi, hon. <laughs> uh, <laughs> one day as Jesus was walking along the shore of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, also called Peter and Andrew, throwing a net into the water for they fish for a living. Jesus called out to them, come, follow me. I will show you how to fish for people. And they left their nets at once and followed him. A little farther up the shore, he saw two brothers, James and John, sitting in a boat with their father, Zebedee, repairing their nets. And he called to them. Two. (laughs) They immediately followed him. They left their boat. They left their father behind. And they followed him. We understand the ministry of Jesus is sort of like a snowball rolling downhill. It begins with this picture of Jesus at his baptism and this story that Jesus told of his time of trial. And through that, we understand our journey out of Egypt, out of slavery, through our baptism by God's Holy Spirit, through our own time of trial and testing, And now, being who he is, he is going to invite people to the kingdom of God. Come, follow me. Undoubtedly, there was supernatural power at work here when we see these amazing examples of these hardworking men, four at first, four, who just dropped their nets and followed Jesus. There's no other information given. And of course, we could preach for hours on that. What does that mean to give up and and, and let the dead bury their dead? And unless you hate your father and mother and follow me, all of those things are, are relative to what's happening here when Jesus walks by and says, follow me. And they do. But we see this individual now is a group of five. And we're going to experience this throughout the course of history now, the past couple of thousands of years, as this snowball continues to roll. And the kingdom of God begins to expand. Why? Because we go out there and we expand it. No, because we share the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. People are invited to be a part of it. There's a difference. That's where I'm going to stop with this piece. Because in our own arrogance, we feel like we're going to take over the job of building the kingdom of God. And I could go to any Christian bookstore now. I could go online and show you a dozen different programs for expanding the kingdom. That's not what we're asked to do. We're asked to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're asked to share the good news. We can save no one. And we can build nothing. The kingdom is here. What we do is by the power of God's Holy Spirit that is manifest in the gospel of Jesus Christ, 
People are invited into it. He makes you a part of it. That makes sense? The other way we start putting the cart before the horse, so to speak. We're going to run out ahead and we're going to show Jesus that we can build the kingdom. Is he's never asked us to do that. And so we need to be careful with the way that we think in our own broken natures, how we can take the gospel and even with the best of intentions, misuse it. Our job is to be light in a dark world. Jesus preaches the truth and he teaches the way. And when we understand as followers of his, we preach the truth. We stand on the fact that Jesus Christ lived, he died, he rose again. We preach that. We do not compromise on the truths of the gospel. And in our lives and at the dinner table, and when we have lunch with colleagues, wherever, whenever, however, we also live and teach the way of the Christian. We demonstrate what it means to be a son or a daughter of the Most High God. We demonstrate what it means to be living in the kingdom. We certainly can be very intentional about that. But we cannot be so arrogant in our thinking that I can adopt a five-step program to build the kingdom of God. The five-step program is preach the truth and teach the way. That's Warner math. But <laughs> the five-step program has two steps. <laughs> That was the joke. <laughs> right? And, and, and that's where I, I want to talk about because, again, we get so wrapped up in churchianity instead of Christianity. And what can we do? We're going to run out ahead. We're going to do this. We've got to do that. We're a church. We've got to do this. We've got to do that. Is Jesus asking us to do any of those things? He may very well be, but we must discern that. We can't jump to one conclusion or another. We can't take the easy way out. This whole preaching and living the way of Jesus Christ, it's not for people who are afraid. And it's not for people who don't want to commit. He asks for total commitment. Okay? So we're going to we just move a little bit forward. I want to show you a few more things after this song. And then I'm going to set you free on the Gospel of Matthew yourself. And we're going to come back again next week and talk about some of the things that we saw and some of the things that we learned. But where we're standing today is this. We, and I, I don't know where you, that's you and that's the Lord. But the kingdom of God is present on earth today. And our message to the dark world is to repent, turn around, look. The kingdom of God is at hand. Let me tell you about it. And invite people into the kingdom. All right. This is my father's world. And that is uh, going to be a little touchstone for the next little bit of uh, discussion here. It is number 58. If you would stand as you're able, please.
thank you, thank you, thank you. That was rebellious. I did not ask you to sit down. <laughs> that was straight out rebellion. If you've not been here before, that's kind of a running, <laughs> that's kind of a running, running funny that we have going here. Okay. So we're preaching truth. And we're learning from Jesus as he teaches us the way. We can't look at our holy scriptures and consider them to be the divine, inspired, infallible word. We can't look at our holy scriptures and profess that they are the inspired, infallible word of God and then not pay any attention to what God is actually trying to reveal through them. If there is a section of the Bible that we really like to do that in, it is this the first third, say, of Matthew. Because we see this journey that Jesus is on, that is, he is showing us the way, the journey that we as followers of his are on. He is preaching the truth of the kingdom of God along the way, uncompromisingly, telling us that when we become children of the Most High God, the first thing we will encounter is evil. Warfare, spiritual warfare, testing, trial, temptation, all of these things. Why? We've talked about this before. Because when you become a child of God and are indwelled by God's good Holy Spirit, the goodness of God and the wicked evilness of Satan can't exist at the same place at the same time. Can't. And so you've said, I profess my faith in Jesus Christ. And we have our time of testing to find out if that's true. Because like we can't pick and choose pieces of the Bible that we want to apply to our lives. Well, this is a really good ethical teaching. I'll follow this one. Whoa, this whole thing about anger or adultery or what I should do with my money. I don't want that one. I want this one. And there's where the scriptures that are all broken up in different chalkboards don't do us very, don't, they don't do us well. Good. They don't do well for us. They don't do good for us. Help. They don't help us out. Because they're all over the wall like sticky notes. And we get to keep that one on the wall and we pull that one down. And we keep that one on the wall and we pull that one down. So when you do read through this, read through it. Jesus is uncompromisingly telling us, teaching us, showing us, living for us, all of those things, what it means to be a follower of Christ. We start with the foundational mindset, the new kingdom mindset. And that's what the Beatitudes are all about. You want to talk about a great reset? This is the great reset from the old to the new. From being dominated by forces from the outside in to being dominated by God's Holy Spirit from the inside out. We move through this into becoming a follower of Jesus Christ. And the first thing that he does now, he's going to lay a theological and spiritual foundation for what it means. What a follower of J Jesus Christ thinks about, feels, looks like. The way that we go about our business, the way that we view other human beings, the Beatitudes, the list of blessings, Beatitude means blessing or list good things. We look at on a large scale as what it means to reset the mind of a broken human being Again, that is dominated by evil forces pressing from the outside in to the mind of Christ that is, of course, dominated and inspired by God's Holy Spirit from the inside out. 
So here we go, right? We're going to just begin this. And again, I'm not going to break each one of them down. Because the preaching today is that collectively, collectively, they provide for the reset that you have to have as a follower of Jesus. You've got to break the strongholds of the old and accept the reality of the new. And the reality of the new is only possible by the power of God's Holy Spirit. Living under the old is your power. Living under the new is his power. And here is the foundation upon which all of those behaviors and things of the Sermon of the Mount are, are built upon. You can't accomplish anything from this point forward if you don't reset with the Beatitudes. Otherwise, you're just, again, you're going to pick and choose. You're going to take what you want. You're going to have the old mindset. Or you're going to be thinking, well, look, more rules, more rules. Here's God just trying to control me. More rules again, blah, 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 same old. Nope, none of that is true. If you can read the Beatitudes and understand the fundamental changes that are inherent in these blessings, these blessings that come with submission to Christ. So look at it that way, right? Beatitudes, big picture Beatitudes. He began to teach them. So here we go, the Sermon on the Mount. One day he saw the crowds gathering. Jesus went up on the mountainside, sat down. His disciples gathered around him and he began to teach them. Now this is interesting. How many disciples are there? Four. But yet there's crowds of people and his disciples gathered around him so we could go down a little rabbit trail about disciple and discipleship and what it means and how did he get all these disciples we only knew he had called four but the people gathered around him nonetheless right and he began to teach and this is the beginning right the, perhaps as a teacher you would call this the anticipatory set teachers in the audience here oh yeah there you are Stace Right? You're going to prime the pump for the things that to come. This is the great spiritual reset for every individual. This is the great spiritual reset for the New Testament church. This is the mind of Christ, not the mind of man. This is the heart of Christ, not the heart of man. God blesses those who are poor and realize their need for him, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Do they have to go out and build it? Do they have to go out and dominate it? Do they have to go out and do No, the kingdom of heaven is theirs. And what does that mean? Poor, poor of spirit, poor, poor, marginalized, lowly, unimportant, Blessed are those who are poor and realize their need for him, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. God blesses those who mourn, for they will be comforted. God blesses those who are humble, for they will inherit the whole earth. God blesses those who hunger and thirst for justice, for they will be satisfied. God blesses those who are merciful, for they will be shown mercy. God blesses those whose hearts are pure, for they will see God. God blesses those who work for peace, for they will be called the children of God. God blesses those who are persecuted for doing right, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. You hear the language that he is speaking here. He's not saying, do these four things and you can get into the, into the kingdom of God. He's not saying, do anything. He's not asking you to do anything. He's not asking you, if you do have material wealth, to go make yourself poor. He's not asking anything. He's saying that the blessing of heaven is upon those who will open their hearts and receive. 
The blessing of the kingdom of God is available to you. You cannot bang down the gates of it in your own arrogance and righteousness. It's here and it's available and blessed are you who are not arrogant enough to believe that you can open the gate yourself. Blessed are you who understand spiritually, I have no spiritual rudder <laughs> other than God's Holy Spirit. Blessed are you who do not start violence or do not have a violent attitude. There's nothing in there about you not defending yourself, defending your family, defending the kingdom. We will do as we are called to do, but it is the heart of God. We don't need to pick that fight. That fight is already here. Does that make sense? The Beatitudes are a telling us that the kingdom of God is a blessing that is here for all who will open heart and mind and understand and receive. Get out of your old way of thinking. Get out of the old way of doing. Get out of the old way of, of garnering the power for yourself or demonstrating to God how good and righteous you are or demonstrating to others how big and powerful that we are as a church, doing all of those different things. Get out of that mindset and get into an open mindset that you are nothing without Christ. Open your heart. Let him Abide within you and you will understand the mind of Christ and the heart of Christ. Blessed are you. You will receive the kingdom of God because each and every one of you were a slave to sin. Operating in your own sense of righteousness. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a foundational understanding that the blessing of God, it's not something that we go get. It is something that is available and we receive by his grace. The Beatitudes speak into the hearts of a Christian again, they're not, I've had people, I've, I've spoken, especially with men who say, I can't be a Christian because I can't be this guy. I can't be this guy. I can't like, just, you know, I'm a, like a man's man. I, I go and I do stuff and I, I don't want to be this type of a person. Meek, mild, weak, stepped on, trampled. That's not any, that's the farthest thing of what the Beatitudes are talking about. The Beatitudes are talking about opening yourself up to the very power that created the universe. But from that step forward, if you accept the Beatitudes and you open that heart, that from that first step forward, it is the power of God emanating from you, speaking to you, leading. He's not asking you to do anything. He's sharing with you the blessing from heaven. The last thing, go ahead, Olivia, or Brian, or whoever's working that. Okay, so anyway, this is where we're going to go. This is your homework assignment. And when we move through this, and we come back, and we begin wholeheartedly in the Sermon on the Mount next week, we are going to approach the Sermon on the Mount with the mindset of the Beatitudes, understanding everything that we have put together to this point. That this is a story. This is a teaching that resonated then and resonates with us now. We're born slaves. We understand that. We are born rebels to God. There's no escaping that. 
None of us have, were born righteous in a right relationship with God. We're born as slaves in Egypt, right? We see the story unfold. We are controlled at that point in time by forces from the outside pressing in, like a child. You don't mess around with your four or five year old child and try to reason and negotiate and teach your way through things. If they're about to jump in a fire, you grab them and you pull them away. Or if they're about to do something dangerous or they're treating somebody very poorly, you say, stop that. And if they don't stop that, then you set them in a corner and make them stop that, right? We're treated, like we're controlled by those outside forces. The Jews were controlled by the law. What do I do? How do I do it? Well, here it is. There's 600 and some. We move through the water as we are saved. We're baptized, as John the Baptist says, by water and the Spirit. We made a big link there, didn't we, in the teaching. John, I baptize with water only. Ritualistic cleansing for the forgiveness of sin. Come back next week because you're going to sin again. I'll do it again. But when we are saved by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, he has taken that sin once for all. Right? We're baptized by water as a representative of us being baptized by God's Holy Spirit. Now the spiritual is introduced into that equation. The new covenant is being inserted into our hearts, right? Into our minds. Next slide. We're tested in the wilderness. The good of God and the evil of the world cannot exist in the same place at the same time. Jesus introduces us to spiritual warfare and what it will be like to be a follower of his right off the bat. I told you he sugarcoats nothing. He stands on the truth and preaches the whole gospel, which is you are a follower of a good God in an evil world. Like you can't, you can't avoid this. You can't. So we may as well go deep into the word and be as equipped as possible for this journey. We begin our ministry. We call disciples. We're all in a very real spiritual sense, fishers of people. We are adopted into the kingdom of God. We're adopted into the kingdom of God. We become fishers of people by sharing the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ with people. We tell people that the kingdom of God is available to you. I cannot grab your hand and bring you into it. But here is everything I know of it. And this has been my experience in it. And I know this to be true. And the kingdom of God is available for you as well. Profess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord. We need to break a mindset that it's us, not him. For only by grace have we been saved. The church can't go out and do that, and you can't go out and do that. But what you are asked to do is preach the truth and teach the way, just like Jesus did. Finally, we adopt a kingdom worldview and mindset. That's where the Beatitudes come in. We're blessed to have the heart and mind of God. It is on our inside that changes. It is our inside that changes. I'm not giving you another set of rules to follow. If you want to be a follower of Jesus, here's a hundred other things that you got to do. It's no longer from the outside in. And oppressive churches and oppressive legalism does that to people because we want to be in charge. Right? The, the authority figures want to be in charge. God is saying, guess what, folks? You went from child to adult. You're in charge of you now. From the inside out. You want to know how to do that? Well, let's read Matthew 1 through 7. There's a real good lesson on how to do that. As a grown-up spiritual person with the power of God from the inside out. 
And it begins with the spiritual reset of the Beatitudes. Blessed are those who will simply and humbly turn to me. Enter into the kingdom of God. And be prepared for constant spiritual warfare. Right? That's where we're plugged in. Right from the beginning, we're plugged in. Good and evil. And we follow, we learn, we grow and become. That's where we're heading into the Sermon on the Mount. All of the different things and behaviors and ways. All of the new way of thinking about things and the way of doing things. We grow and we learn and we become as individuals and as a congregation. We're given a whole new set of behaviors. We're taught that by the power of God's Holy Spirit, we can't be controlled. We can be controlled from the inside by the power of God and the leading of his Holy Spirit. Oh, and minor detail, constant spiritual warfare. Like while we're doing all of this, it's kind of like changing the tires on your car while you're driving 60 miles per hour down the highway. Oh, by the way, once you profess faith in Jesus Christ, it's on. Your growth is on. You becoming the child of God that he saw when he created you in your mother's womb is on. The growth of your relationships, the understanding of your worldview is on. And so is the fight for light. Light in the world. Like I said, you're changing your spiritual tires. You're changing yourself while you're driving down the highway. So we go and we'll read. I want to read this together. I want to be able to preach the truth of the gospel. I want to be able to teach the way of Jesus Christ. So remember, ignore your chapters and verses. Ignore your subheadings. Experience Jesus there from the Beatitudes on, especially teaching. Teaching. And watch how each teaching relates to the other teaching. One, and two, experience how each teaching relates to the Beatitudes. Because without that foundation, those teachings don't, they don't have a root in your soul. It's just a new way of thinking about something. Let's pray. Father, we just want to Thank you for your word, for opening our hearts and our minds to understand your word, for our own spiritual rebirth, for understanding that there is nothing that you have given us that is random. You know us. Lord, may we understand what you are teaching so that we do not have a simple, shallow, rootless faith. May we understand your word and even the way you have constructed your word to speak to us, to teach us, to inspire us. And Lord, as we move forward this week and we go inside our Bibles, I pray for the supernatural inspiration for every individual who experiences this teaching through the gospel of Matthew, this power, this electricity that shows us that grows us, that rebukes us, that empowers us, that chastises us. Help us to understand. Help us to grow and to become the people of God that you see. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh, that last slide there. Um, I just want to, can you go back to it? One, the last slide. 
There it is. Nothing about scripture is random. God is always preaching the truth, always teaching the way. There's nothing random in your Bible. Nothing is just random. Read the story and feel it. So we'll be back in just a couple of minutes with the prayer service. And um, thank you very much. Can, can I just ask? Okay, I just want to ask here. I don't want to keep you forever. I won't keep you forever. All right? That's a lot. Is it too much? You know what I'm saying? The way that I want to approach this is not taking a spiritual shower one drop at a time. I want you, I want you to get in the shower. You see what I'm saying? It's not for me to, to do that. It's for you to, and I'm, I'm trying to help, if I am helping you get in the word and experience that shower. It's, it's glorious. It's amazing. It's powerful. So if it's, if it's not helping, you need to let me know. But um, that's what I want for you. I want you to be just enthralled by God's word and living it. I want you, whether you're in a cubicle or a battlefield, or where, I want you preaching the truth and teaching the way every day of your lives. There's only one way to do that, and it's not the scriptures according to Brian. It's the scriptures according to God's Holy Spirit. You got to get in there. We got to get in there. So that's where I'm coming from. So you guys keep giving me feedback and letting me know, though. Okay? Thank you.